Hello folks, this is Man of Lore. I'm doing a book review today. I'm reviewing the Tamarar series by Naomi Novak. I've read seven books in this series so far. I'm currently reading the eighth and I found it very entertaining. This series is set in the Napoleonic War era with significant historical accuracy. The fanciful twist being the existence of dragons. These dragons exist around the world and in the case of Europe have been domesticated since the time of Rome. They are used for a variety of things, but in this series primarily as a sort of air force to great effect. The manifestation of dragons in this book is a fairly standard one of sentient beings, albeit with a strong animal nature. Novak maintains this mix fairly consistently, along with folklore, myth mythology, and contemporary fantasy. She makes a significant effort to be consistent with this nature of, dra of the dragons that I find quite impressive. There are some of the classic dragon traits, such as certain breeds being able to breathe fire, while some inventive ones, such as breeds that spit acid, and one particular Chinese breed has what is called the Divine Wind, which is a powerful sonic blast. She also makes sure to illustrate numerous different breeds, differing from people to people and region to region, reflecting a natural difference in biology, contrasted with the differences in each people's use, need, and ideological view of dragons. For example, Chinese dragons view, are viewed as independent, sentient beings who have their own lives and careers, and can buy and purchase things just like any person, whereas the Europeans tend to hold the dragons as not quite animals, but certainly a second-class being. Another example of the difference in the Incas dragon, are the Incas dragons, are covered in a feather-like scale and instead of the more reptilian-like scales of European and Asian dragons. There are also other dragon-like creatures such as sea serpents and an interesting dragon-like creature straight out of Aboriginal mythology in Australia, which I'll leave vague so as not to spoil the storyline. The author has made significant effort to envision the difference in the balance of power that these creatures would elicit. The shifting balance of power in history prior to the time of her, of her story is neglected. Yet her theory is intriguing and mostly sensible. An example of this is giving the Chinese credit for being the most superior dragon handlers and breeders, making the Chinese one of the strongest nations of the period, yet their strength is primarily in their dragons. Still, they retain the inward-looking nationalist mindset of the Chinese. So while the background does not contain the depth a history buff like me would like, the current world Novak built is mostly realistic. The current state of affairs, of course, is viewed through their altered reality, their being dragons, and the natural distribution of them. Then Novak theorizes on what that would mean to native populations as they developed and domesticated the dragons. This obviously would greatly alter the fate of certain peoples. One such alteration is the formation of an African empire in the center of the continent and the survival of the Inca empire past contact with Spain and Portugal. Her individual characters are deep, likable, and mostly true to the nature of their people and the time. There is some stereotypical stiffness, unfortunately, partly to bolster her storylines, but it's fairly minimal and not unusual. And then there is some influence of the author's gender that I think affects some of the male characters, decisions which I disagree with them making. Yet such discrepancies are generally to be expected. <laughs> The main character is Captain William Lawrence, a British Navy captain with a promising career and mid-level noble birth. Captain Lawrence captures a French naval ship that has a dragon egg aboard. Much to the disappointment of Captain Lawrence, the egg hatches before he can get back to England with his great prize. According to most Europeans' methods of dragon handling, at hatching, a prospective Air Corps officer attempts to harness the dragon immediately after it hatches in order to tame and bond the dragon to his captain. This process is then finished by the new captain feeding the hatchling. Being a simple Navy ship, there were no Air Corps personnel or officers on board. Several men are present, but all are not keen to bond with the dragon, yet it must be done. So, of course, of all the men there, this dragon chooses Captain Lawrence. Captain Lawrence then names him Tamarar. This dragon turns out to be a highly sought-after Chinese breed, Back in England, the Air Corps attempts to entice Tamarr to choose an Air Corps officer. 
but he refuses to release Captain Lawrence from his bond. Captain Lawrence has no choice but to give up his promising Navy career and join the Air Corps. <laughs> the change is a bit of a culture shock for Captain Lawrence to leave the very strict and tradition-laden British Navy for a much more laid-back branch of the military. Added to this is that the inner workings are mostly held in secrecy, such as the fact that one particular highly prized dragon breed, the Longwing, which spits acid, only accepts women for their captains. This, of course, is quite scandalous for this time of history, yet the author handles this discrepancy quite well by explaining this practice is kept on a need-to-know basis. And generally, the women who are these captains are from certain family lines, and the dragons are passed from mother to daughter for the most part, as the dragons live for several hundred years. Thus, they need multiple captains over their lifetime. As one woman captain says, Captain Roland, Jokes, they are sort of a breeding program for the riders as well as the dragons. <laughs> While the women have certain reputation for looseness in the corps, <clears throat> it is no more than happens among soldiers in general. Of course, the contrast of tradition and genders makes the practice a more glaring inconsistency with the traditions of the time. Captain Lawrence is, of course, very uncomfortable, but understands the necessity of having these women. And he has to deal with the difficulties of having girls serve under him as runners, ensigns, midshipmen, etc. So they can gain experience to eventually serve on their mother's dragons. Despite the politics of today, the author keeps that out of her book and keeps things proper to the time period. Novak takes great pains to weave historical events in the story and around the great altering fact of dragons. So as you can imagine, the might of Napoleon is magnified significantly by the ability of the continental Europe to feed more dragons versus the small island of Britain. <laughs> These and other factors significantly shifts the course of the war. I will say the author does cheat a bit in her efforts of storytelling as the series progresses by taking Le Captain Lawrence and Tamar on a sort of grand tour of the peoples of the world and their dragons. Yet, mostly she does this in a plausible way. So that while she is using this tactic to generate story, she is doing it in an entertaining way. She also develops the characters of dragons significantly, although some of the depth of their character does wane as the series progresses. Some newer characters become somewhat shallow and repetitive. Novak generally keeps modern politics out of her book, but she does address polit certain political issues of the day, such as the great issue of slavery. Captain Lawrence comes from a strong abolitionist family, while his naval second-in-command and friend, Riley, comes from a family who owns many slaves. So this is a point of contention between Captain Lawrence and Captain Riley, which manifests itself many other times through the book series. Logically, this becomes a point of contention with the dragons since they are sentient beings that share the planet with, this, with man. This issue is further heightened by the fact that dragons are treated differently among the different peoples of the world such as one people treating them as a sort of semi-god ancestor figure, or how the Chinese treat them as individual sovereign beings and fellow citizens of the empire, able to have their own careers, pursuits, and property. This conflict becomes an underlying subplot in the series. America plays a very small role thus far in the series, which is historically accurate considering the period of history. The great European powers are wrapped up in the struggle of fighting with Napoleon, Yet at the same time, Novak presents the Americans as an up-and-coming nation with a disproportionately large dragon population, partly aided by the Native Americans' dragon breeding program. I do recommend reading this book series. I mostly listen to this series on audiobook via the Overdrive app, which is a free app connected with the public library system. I found it to be interesting. Book series that made for entertaining read. While inaccuracies, especially historical inaccuracies, are a pet peeve of mine, they're small enough and infrequent enough that I, will th I still thoroughly enjoy the series. So if that's an acceptable standard for you, I definitely think you'll enjoy it. With the strong characters, great character interaction, and creative overall storyline, it was an enjoyable read. Even better is this series is not dripping with wokeness, which I greatly appreciate, especially as she tackles issues that would be very problematic under political, political correctness such as slavery, gender roles, etc. 
I appreciate the fact that she sticks to a much more historically accurate description of these points, making it a good story rather than a political rag. Let me know what you think in the comments. Please like, subscribe, and share. I appreciate your time. Thank you.